Let's see what AOC's saying. Um, and just want to hop on, and I want to talk with you all about a lot of different things. Um, Damn, Linda Sarsour, about, that's a name I haven't seen in know, a minute. Where we move forward from here. I said hi, it didn't show up. What our thoughts on this are. Um, and what's next for all of us ahead? Um, it did it? I guess I'll start with a little bit of the lay of the land here. Um, Linda Sarsour saying, we got this. That's right. We do. We have no choice. Um, and I'll get to that in a minute. But very quickly here, lay of the land. As we know, uh, Donald Trump won the presidency. Uh, Vice President Harris conceded the race today. She called um, President-elect Trump to concede the race personally and underscored uh, the importance of a peaceful transition of power and that she was committed to that. Um, and also underscored the importance and the truth that we do not uh, pledge the- to any individual or any office, but we pledge our oath to the Constitution of the United States. Um, now, in terms of everything else, as we know, Donald Trump won the presidency, a Republican Party has won the Senate, and the U.S. House of Representatives has still not been called as of this morning. I believe there were over 50 races that were still outstanding. Uh, So neither party has officially declared or has been officially declared as having the House majority. For a lot of people who are asking functional questions about what can we do, a lot hinges on what happens in the House of Representatives and control of the U.S. House of Representatives. If Democrats control the House, um, that gives a slight ledge um, to resist and prevent some of the worst legislative proposals from going through. For example, um, or, you know, in contrast, if Republicans um, win majority of the House, they have discussed passing a national abortion ban. Um, And there would be, if they have the votes for it as a party, legislatively, there would be very little I love that uh, we could do the left to never stop fails to do the one thing the where they just like hyper focus on people who are the there who they are the closest aligned Trump to ideologically potentially be and just yell at them law. it's as, a really unsuccessful and unproductive way to move abortion ban I criticize AOC uh, all the time I do not think that over any state law I do not think that she so is the enemy if you are in California um, or New York and if you do then you're wrong you know a national abortion ban is a national abortion ban. It would ban abortion in the United States of America, regardless of your state law. Um, so that is just one of many different types of legislative provisions that um, ha- control of the House really has a lot of influence over. I believe right now that Democrats are looking Uh, to be competitive, we have a shot at getting control of the House of Representatives, which would block some of the most heinous legislative proposals uh, that would have to pass through the House, Senate, and presidency. Um, On this note, I actually think when we talk about what needs to be done and how we look ahead, and I don't want to bounce around too much, But um, one of the big things that I think is going to be very important for all of us, uh, and again, I might be bouncing around because I am what is known, and I believe in a theory of politics known as inside-outside politics. That means that I believe we have people 
and elected officials on the inside um, that tried to agitate or rather tried to organize and build power and um, help influence decisions on the inside of institutions, but that that is not, that alone is not enough or sufficient um, to make change in this country, that we also need mass movement politics and people's robust people's movement and that those people's movements are where the actual seats of power and influence in this country come from, from a mass organized and mobilized base of working people. Um, and so on an outside perspective, uh, there are a lot of things that we have to do ahead of us. Uh, one of those things I believe is something known as programs of political education um, that can go from the most basic to she said re -education. more complex. Uh, but we need to learn a lot. Um, we need to build a base of knowledge uh, among ourselves and people that we know. A lot of people may not know how uh, laws are passed or how our governance works, and that's okay, but it's very important that we start to learn. Um, now, um, sorry, I'm just keeping up with some of your comments uh, as well. Um, now, what this means is that I think it's important, uh, and I'm gonna just give it to you all very straight. This is going to be a very, 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 very challenging, difficult time. Um, we can use the next several months to prepare as best as we can. Uh, Trump would be inaugurated around January 20th or so. Uh, and we can use- She's saying organize the January 6th. To prepare as best as we can. Instructions for what is going to be heard. very challenging and very difficult time for millions of people in this country. Um, a lot of people have asked me that, you know, is Trump actually going to do the things that he said he's going to do? I think, listen, no one has a crystal ball, but I think that it is, and what we said on the campaign trail, when he says he's going to do something, believe him. Stop the steal. Um, just, I believe just today, his press secretary confirmed his commitment or, to I mean, start mass the deportations steal. beginning, uh, you know, the day or day after of his presidency. Talking about RFK trying to remove fluoridated water from the United States, which, you know, there are public health, I'm not going to hear, I'm not here to get into debates with anybody or, you know, start fires in the group chat or whatever. But, um, you know, when you look at public health comprehensive studies, uh, of, you know, cities and towns that have done that, the amount of kids that uh, really suffer health outcomes and need to, you know, receive, I believe, like antibiotic injections, all this other crazy stuff um, is through the roof. We're talking about vaccines that uh, may be taken off the market entirely. Uh, and, you know, even Mitch McConnell, I believe, uh, if I'm not mistaken, still suffers from uh, from complications of, I believe, about polio that he had when he was a child. Um, this is real. This is real. And I'm not here to sugarcoat what we all are about to collectively experience. Um, but I think that what we can do to prepare is build community. Um, we do not have a choice. We don't have a choice. Our choice is to build. Our choice is to continue to fight. Our choice is to win. Our choice is to have each other. Um, we are about to enter a political period that will have consequences for the rest of our lives. We cannot give up. We now find ourselves in a time in history that has precedent 
and we find ourselves you're gonna have to I be careful with the january 6th stuff in, time, in case it actually happens i was thinking about that and i just don't think that it's likely but then again liberals are going kind of lebanon right now so maybe it is likely that mobilized for everyone one uh listening i just want to say i'm obviously joking i don't think that would be authoritarianism a good thing i would and certainly not advocate for it i would however watch it and laugh era that we are poised to enter um donald trump has talked about turning the military on U.S. citizens that he deems his domestic political enemies. Um, authoritarians and people that he affiliates closely with and strong men abroad uh, in regimes like that, it is not uncommon Liberals to Liberals love our institutions far too much. Or legislative opponents. To actively um, disrupt them. This is the world that we very realistically may be entering. And the way that we do everything that we can to prevent this is by building a very strong social fabric and social infrastructure. Now, um, a lot of people have asked me, and I've posted some of the things before, how have we gotten here? How can we improve? Um, a lot of people have also asked me about thoughts on the Democratic Party or certain communities that were lost or, you know, what have you. Um, and I'm, I will comment a bit on some of that. Uh, but the one thing that I want to open up uh, and say is that first and foremost, here's my personal take. <laughs> she needs Anyone to go ASAP. Yeah, you're right, morning, dude. I think we should replace our district with uh, another right, Nancy I say, Pelosi. I urge this morning to wake up and like point one main finger or articulate. I like that unironically there are people in the chat advocating to, to like take a happened. do a break from the DNC right now. This is the weakest the party has ever been. It's an opportunity to try and organize and change it within your uh, within your abilities uh, towards whatever you envision it to be. But everybody's like nah dude it's time this is the gloria la but riva or claudia to say or no, that yeah, gloria de la thing, riva uh rise up it, it is an it is an avalanche of different things um but we can get into some of it i've gotten a lot of questions about the democratic party i've got a lot of questions about women about what this means about latinos about this group or that group and um we can try to dig into some of these things now, but I think what's most important is for us to remain pretty high-minded about a lot of this. Uh, in that, I mean, what is going to be most important in this time is rejecting sectarianism and understanding that we have to be there's zero united. evidence that's possible you As are reflecting people, on the last eight years you think there's a dnc that will allow a space to yeah dude the working class in this country that's why i'm saying uh, the agenda. acp is going to win Period. next election we have had an enormous setback the american communist party rise in this up election because the fascist won a lot of working class support which has happened before in history and we can talk about that. But, um, you know, I think what is important is that we have to be able to hold that analysis and have these discussions without turning on each other. And if I can take off my more broad commentary hat on and put on a more progressive or whatever one may want to call that, left or progressive or working class or whatever it is, um, we have to be able to, to construct a culture that is productive, that is focused on growing, that is not sectarianism and does not tear one another apart over the narcissism of small differences. It we will remain marginal and small and incapable of confronting the challenges ahead of us if we cannot learn to hold difference and understand and be able to distinguish an ally 
from an opponent. And that has been a challenge up to this point. And we will not survive if we cannot grow past that. Um, Now, I think that when it comes to the Democratic Party, one of the big questions that we've seen is like, what has happened with the Democratic Party and the working class? And I think that it's, to me, from my vantage point, um, I think I see a lot of what's happened. I was a waitress um, right up until I got elected to Congress. This was not a cute summer job that I had as a teenager, and then I did some jobs, and then I got elected to Congress years later. I went from wiping down a bar and walking behind it to walking into the halls of Congress. And um, the reason I did that and the reason I ran was not because I was running against a Republican. It's because I ran against a Democrat that I did not believe uh, centered families or communities like mine or saw the pain of people like me. And it, and a lot of what I saw at that time was a Democrat that only ran against Trump and did not support a vision that with clarity that spoke to my material reality. And I got to a point as a waitress where I felt like if my member of Congress wouldn't support a $15 minimum wage and say it with their full chest with clarity like that, then I would. And again, I'm not speaking for every single district or every single person. I am counting the story, recounting the story of what happened in my life. I felt like if my representative from a deep blue seat could not fight for my right to have health care unequivocally, then I would fight for my right to have health care and for my community's right to have health care guaranteed unequivocally. Um, I, at the time, was represented by, you know, or felt like our representation took a lot of corporate money, a lot of lobbyist money, and answered more to the people and the class that they raised money from than the people who voted for them. And that, and I ran for office to change that. Um, Now, I'm not here to, you know, I think there's two important things to communicate here. A party loses and another party wins. And I think it's important to also state here that Kamala Harris was given an assignment that no other person in American history was given to construct a presidential campaign in 90 to 100 days with absolutely no expectation or anticipation that she would be called to that assignment um, and have to deliver the country from an enormous fascist threat that had already been campaigning and priming the pump for essentially eight years. So any observations that I raise, I believe have to do with longer term trends around our party and what we can do to improve and get back to our roots as champions of the working class. And this is not, none of this is meant to be constructed at her. Um, A lot of times I think people try to erase one criticism for another. Oh, it wasn't this, it wasn't that. But the fact of the matter is, (sighs) you know, this race may not have been decided by any one individual factor, but misogyny is very, very real in this country. As another widely known woman of color in office, you know, I knew that sexism and racism were real, but it was not until I got subjected to a national stage 
that I actually was shocked at how bad it is. Oh. You know, you Once grow again, up with it. Once again, sexism and racism has played a prominent role in Kamala Harris like being, being undermined. The receiving line but having said that, again, Kamala Harris is an adult woman and uh, you feel that she is more than capable of launching a better campaign. She just chose not to do so. So I it think is. that a lot of that is still is not partisan. A lot of that is still going to be, uh, you know, in, it's something it that we were aware of. You know what I mean? It's something that Kamala politics. Harris was aware of. She and knew. That's a hard she actually actively messaged against it and that didn't run on a I'm with her style campaign in the way that Hillary Clinton did. Spaces. It's not a moral thing. It is how our. I think one of the saddest states of affairs in this, this process has been that and, the Democratic Party's um, bench is filled to the brim with real. really good talent from Gretchen very, Whitmer very and Tim Waltz and Andy Bashar um, and many others like that. And, when um, we look and yet at races, the, the campaign we had margins, was the easiest swap out with Kamala Harris. And that's fine. As long as she ran a more progressive campaign, as long as she actively another. communicated um, the issues that Americans were uh, experiencing, Harris that she was going to solve Kamala those issues. This would have we been have a, a much more successful today. campaign for her, as um, you wouldn't have seen the base and so of, it of support from the normal constituencies that historically have gone out and voted for Kamala Harris uh, fall apart. It's that simple. A lot of people will look to like the tack to the right uh, and, and how much more Republicans voted, how, much, how many of these districts like turn Republican, not realizing that a lot of those districts still had a bunch of, especially swing districts, had a bunch of liberals that didn't go out and vote for one reason or another not because they're like radical socialists or because like you know they're single issue voters on gaza even though that probably played a role in this as well there are plenty of people who just simply didn't go out and vote and that is because of bad messaging that is because of harm reduction it's skyrocketing that groceries are insane and that structurally a party that relies on the financial Backing. And again, this is an area where there's disagreement within yeah, the party. Yeah, racism and misogyny are, but Ilhan Omar and Rashida Tlaib won. I've been very clear about what my assessment And like, it's not like Mexico is more woke of a country than America to is, me, you know what I mean? It's not less or more woke. Claudia Scheinbaum is literally a Jewish woman who is a socialist entire system in a 98% Catholic country. Money. And before people say that it's only Democrats that rely on this, just understand <sighs> that Donald Trump personally thanked Elon Musk, a billionaire, for delivering him the presidency. Donald Trump works for Elon Musk. He works for Jeff Bezos. He works for the oil execs. That's what he does, okay? Our entire system is consumed by big money, by billionaires, by lobbyists. Where it is complicated for Democrats is that we are supposed to champion the working class. And when you just you mad you lost Silicon Valley, I mean, it's not like Silicon Valley was ever money, in the tank. Um, who's who exerts a lot of interest to get you to not check the power of concentrated wealth, then you can't deliver on those promises. When you have billionaires, for example, who are cutting very big checks on one hand, and then with the other hand, publicly threatening the current Federal Trade Commission chair, Trade Commission chair, uh, in, and essentially saying she's got to go, that does not allow us, that puts us in a bind, no? Like structurally, that is a bind. Um, it's a fundamental misalignment of mission and what powers us. And I wish I could say that this is just an easy problem to solve and just don't take it. And I think one of and I no don't No more take NLRB. It, but I think no more Lena one Khan. of the reasons that this continues to be an issue is because I think a lot of people, especially in tough seats, look down the barrel of that and it's either they either, you know, you either compromise and get that big money to either stay out of the race or do whatever, or that big money goes to the Republican. I don't know. But at the end of the day, the ultimate problem is our ability to clearly and forthrightly uh, advocate for an agenda that clearly champions the working class. To me, that's things like $15 minimum wage, Medicare for all, 
or at the very least lowering the age of Medicare um, until it hits zero. But I mean, whether whatever those things may be, um, it also makes it hard. It applies a lot of pressure uh, that I think is restrictive in allowing Democrats with their full chest to actually explain to people who is raising these prices. And so instead, so instead of saying things like, by the way, Kroger or, you know, um, CDS or Rite Aid or ExxonMobil are price gouging you. And these companies, these corporations or these billionaires are the ones that are screwing you over and jacking up your prices. Yeah, $15 within an inch is of your already life, low now with the way the inflation their works. Power. Instead, we get we're combating inflation. And this is a passive voice perspective that doesn't help people understand why is this happening and who is it doing it and who is doing it and how do we solve the problem. And that doesn't mean that there aren't things that the party is doing to try to tackle those things. President Biden passed the Inflation Reduction Act. Inflation went down. He also did a lot of things. He named that FTC chair, Lena Khan, that that is working on tackling these huge corporate monopolies. He has done these things. Um, uh, but we all need to amplify and publicly educate and talk about why more needs to be done as a chorus. And, um, and so that is like, these are some of the structural contradictions in my view, uh, that make it challenging for us to speak in clear terms, because when it's actually time to do the policy work, I don't understand why AOC it is a very wide coalition will outflank of Democrats, Bernie on Israel. And say, well, we don't want to say 15. AOC will outflank Bernie on Israel. Right, which is like objectively a, a more dangerous position to be in. But then when it comes to domestic criticisms, like even Bernie's just like letting it loose, you know, on the failures of the Democratic Party. And I feel like AOC is not going far enough. I just. Um, he's saying sense. the thing clearly. And it then puts you on a back foot because people don't really understand Democrats lost because they're too tough on the border just shut the fuck up well, and never have an opinion again you fucking idiot it's all your fault just be normal on immigration everybody hates communism and Trotskyism just be fucking normal saying it because you know it's not going to work he's saying it um and so why does this I fucking idiot that, talk um, about issues that he know, does not understand huge, just keep complaining about how China has overtaken uh Australia or something dumbass um, that actually materially and powerfully articulates. Yeah, we the should filter that account. That people Never send expect. me that fucking dipshit tweet again. That is uh, not in again. a generalized way of prices are going to go down or inflation is going to be tackled. But moreover, we will raise the minimum wage. And I'm not. And again, Vice President Harris did that. She did that, and she ran a campaign. That And she was tasked with an assignment that was nearly impossible. Um, and she made it possible. This race was so close. Um, many people uh, also raising, and I think rightfully so, the issue of Gaza. And I think that when we talk about this issue, it's not just, you know, a lot of hay was made about vote margins and all of this. And let's be very clear here. The margin of third party voters in this election was not the margin of difference between Democratic votes and Republican votes. Um, now, there's a lot of data to dig into there and all of that stuff. But I actually think a lot of people in the movement understood the stakes and the assignment. And you may have had a very small degree of third party voters, but ultimately I do think that the majority of people understood the difference between Kamala Harris and Donald Trump and the stakes of that. And it may not have felt good and people may not have enjoyed it or felt supportive uh, of the platform, but they understood the stakes. 
Um, and so I don't believe in scapegoating um, this. However, I also think it is important to note that the landscape of Gaza and the horrors of what was happening made organizing very difficult, needless to say. Um, I think that for some of the most prolific organizers in this country are activists and activist communities and having to contend with what most, I would argue, almost most of a strong activist organizing mobilizing base uh, and many who lead that base consider a genocide. It, I don't think I, and like whether that is a, again, the horrors of, of everything that's going on. Let's, and again, I'm not even trying to open an argument here, but the horrors and the pain and all of it from October 7th through today, through the hostages, all of it, the lack of resolution the lack of conclusion, the fact that Netanyahu dragged this out and just lapped the Biden administration at every turn, um, very much dampened and complicated and added a tremendous amount of static to organizing momentum and capacity throughout the entire year. We, whether people like that or not, it is, in my view, a, an important part of the landscape of what was going on. Um, and uh, people can take it, people can leave it. I don't think it's something that we can ignore. Um, you know, there's other issues too. Our media, and here's the one that I think is the most important. Um, at the end of the day, and I alluded this to this earlier, our entire political apparatus has been captured by a billionaire class. It's been captured by a corporate class and a billionaire class. Jeff Bezos owns the Washington Post. And that billionaire class went fully mask off and the plutocracy in this country went fully mask off this cycle. Jeff Bezos owns the Washington Post. He pressured the Post into not making an endorsement. Don't say it about LA Times. LA Times is in the tank for Gaza. It doesn't matter if that is influential or not in how a person votes or what, <sighs> what have you. What matters is that we should not, we can now dispense ourselves. Yeah, she's saying the Dems ignored the issue the and shouldn't have. That a handful of people in this country are deeply and profoundly manipulating our democracy to their own self-interest. I'm not impugning the incredibly hardworking journalists at the Washington Post, but it is simply to name who owns it and the limitations. I don't know where your finances are, but can you buy a newspaper uh, is a wonderful question that, owned that perfectly demonstrates Elon how Musk little people understand how much money I Twitter, make versus what it takes to purchase a newspaper. A large space of conversation uh, and organizing. Yeah, let me go buy a newspaper with my spare three billion dollars. Political ends. Uh, you have a billionaire fund and the amount of money that he poured in. He didn't just buy X. He poured in just ungodly sums of money in uh, dark money in our elections. You have an entire podcast network that is financed by a similar billionaire and dark money class. And um, yeah, guys, this, if, if enough of you subscribe to me, structural I'll be able to purchase a fucking newspaper. Why our country is so polarized. You know? So please subscribe uh, for six dollars or for with free with a Twitch Prime. The media we consume and who owns and influences the media that we consume. I'm joking, by the way. So where do we go from You here? can still subscribe if you want um, to. Twitch Prime is free. Well, first and foremost, but I won't I be able to purchase a newspaper. That if you are a constituent, I would need like of mine uh, in New York probably like a million subscribers. In parts of the Bronx and Queens. First and foremost, that's that's. That's my first responsibility. That is the specific population of people who have elected me and whose job I have to steward and- You should um, start a TYT style network. No, first, dude, I don't wanna do that. I can't do that. Um, but if you are a constituent of mine, 
uh, first and foremost, I am committed to doing everything in my power to protect you. That power will be limited uh, in a Trump administration. Um, Project 2025 is real. It's real. It's not a campaign joke. It's not an attack. The Heritage Foundation is the conservative foundation, the institution and organization that orchestrates Republican governance. They would not put millions of dollars into preparing this plan and it being co-authored by many people in the Trump administration if they were not fully prepared to implement it. Um, this is gonna be a very scary time. And again, I cannot emphasize how important it is that we as an aligned people uh, be very cautious about attacking one another and um, yeah, about attacking one another and to me, one of the big organizing lessons that I feel is that when it comes to who you choose to organize with, I think it's really important to understand that, you know, maybe it's not just about fully aligning with someone just because of what they're organizing for. It's really important to pay attention to how they are organizing. And if someone is using a righteous cause as a cover for cruel methods and dehumanizing others, personally, that is not someone that I trust to organize with because our job is to grow. And the reason we are in this position is because we do not have a raw majority of people who are ideologically aligned. And in instances where you do not have an outright majority, we must develop coalitions. And the name of the game in coalitions is that is that we have to be able to align with people that we are not fully in agreement with in the name of a larger cause. Um, that goes for any movement and it goes for any cause. Um, and Do you believe identity politics is over, brother? Really, really. Identity really politics important. is hot as ever. Um, okay, it's just white it identity politics. Uh, that kind of cruelty or there's never been a moment where people were like, "Man, I really um, love identity politics." Momentum. Like no one ever and did that. And that was just like a thing that I the Democratic Party presented as a false reality. That these folks and they dropped it with Joseph Robin and Brandon. Powerful people, um, bankrolling disruptors in people's movements. <laughs> And instead of diminishing what a person is fighting for, I think it's just important that we build together alongside people. Do I believe that leftists have to organize together? Yeah, no shit. That's a, a, constantly what I do and constantly what I yell about. In addition to what they're organizing for. I make fun of every um, aspect of the left, uh, but you know, also will always tell you like them, your enemies are um, your foremost, enemies are not going to be of the left. There's a couple of different realities for us to contend with at the same time. Um, I do think it's important to recognize that that the black electorate, first of all, black voters, I believe, remain the most one of the most prescient voting bloc uh, in the United States, point blank period. Um, and we see that bear out in our numbers. That being said, mm -hmm. very often there's a lot of ink spilled before and after elections about black men, Latino men, Latinos, people of color, etc. And we can dig into the fine points of where Lamau. places eroded support and not. Congratulations, but we Trump! Be Make very Israel clear great. That people of color voted for Kamala Harris in majorities. There's always this thing after a cycle, especially if there's any diminishment, to blame communities that overwhelmingly and majority vote uh, for Democrats when that vote diminishes slightly. Instead of us like really taking a look at what is happening with a, for example, white electorate that only votes 17% for the Democrat. And it's really interesting to me because when it's time to govern, those communities get so centered and their concerns get so centered. And it's like nothing we do sometimes can win these electorates over. And I'm not here to dismiss it, but
but we need to really dig into some of those reasons. And uh, we should not use communities that are part of the Democratic coalition as scapegoats for other communities that have not been voting with the Democratic coalition. We need to separate these things. I'm not saying that we're going to gloss over what has happened here, but I think a big part of what has happened here is is the erosion of a working class agenda and articulating a working class agenda. And when you add that in the context of racism in this country, and when you add that in the context of misogyny in this country, you get a perfect storm of what is what I think we witnessed last night. You know, this a lot of this comes down to, again, this enormous task that we have of political education, of race and class consciousness, um, and people understanding that these billionaires are not looking out for us. They are grinding us to a pulp and they are eating us for breakfast. They are burning our planet. And um, I just want you all to know that in terms of what guided and has guided me over the last year is that every single decision I made and every effort that I made, whether people criticize it or not or what have you, was just centered on trying to prevent this outcome. Um, it was my single biggest priority is, was preventing a Donald Trump presidency. Um, it informed my decisions, my actions, um, and we're, we are where we are today. Um, and we have a lot of work to do. I did not want to be in a place where on November 6th, we were preparing to resist a fascist regi regime. I wanted to be fighting the corporate establishment of the Democratic Party instead. Um, but we're not in that place. We're in this place. And it is going to take a huge level of effort and solidarity. We are going to be looking towards our brothers and sisters in the labor movement, in the human and civil rights movement. Um, and we are going to have to resist. It's this really interesting thing. Resist this confluence of like, first of all, I've never ascribed to this idea. And this is, I know this is going to upset people, but genuinely when I came to politics, it was not about trying to articulate to the world about what being a quote unquote leftist is. I always considered myself as running from the bottom. And this is not about left and right, but this is about top and bottom and that we have to run from the bottom up. And, um, and some may say, well, left is bottom. And depending on your worldview, yes. But I think there's this very interesting confluence that we see from, I think, more conservative spaces that the alienation of the working class has to do with people of different identities standing together. And to me, the alienation of, or and like this idea of like wokeism, but to me, the alienation, the Democratic Party's alienation of the working class has to do with the fact that we haven't been able to deliver on a $15 minimum wage, etc., for many different re reasons. And we have to put those demands front and center um, in order to do that. And we shouldn't be afraid to fight for what we believe in. Um, and we shouldn't be afraid to fight, period. Um, but I'm, again, I'm not here to say that we've got all of the answers. A lot of things that people are scared about, a national abortion ban, that would, that would require house control, but you know, dismantling the Department of Education, all of these things. Trump is an autocrat and we are in a much worse position now than we were when he was last president because he is much more prepared uh, and he is much more competent and he knows what mistakes he made last time. And so we are poised to enter a much darker, much scarier time that we, whose consequences we will be living with for the rest of our lives. Um, even just from a climate perspective. Uh, I wish I could say that we could undo all of the damage that we are about to, uh, or we are poised to endure, but we there's some things we will not recover from. We will not recover from blowing past 1.5 degrees centigrade or two degrees centigrade of warming. And we will live with the consequences of that for the rest of our lives. Um, and I'm sorry to say that, 
uh, but it is true. There are other things that we can fight for and we will have to fight for. Um, but I just want you all to know that as long as I'm here, I will be fighting alongside with you. And this just happened yesterday. I don't have marching orders for you right now. My marching orders would basically be to find your safe network of people, um, to find your pod, to find your community. We have to do a lot of community building. And by that, I don't just mean organizing politically. I mean active community building. We are in a position where the isolation of of a capitalist system, the isolation produced by COVID, just where we are as a society, people working four jobs, you know, three, four jobs to make ends meet. We do not have community. And believe it or not, community, whether it's your church or mosque or temple, whether Say it's it, a AOC. meeting group, Start whether to steal. it's, you know, your dinner circle, Building that community is actually far more transformative. Start and the steal. Far more important than you may realize. And people may dismiss Why it. Why won't anybody say it? Silly or frivolous. It is not. I guarantee you it is not. And you're actually going to get cooked, Lamau. Where people finding their friends and finding their circle. I is forget a that there's like people who literally think that if the election was stolen right now. Group that is Guys, close to you, the election was not stolen. You okay, you are probably in a similar it was lost. boat as so many Americans right now. It's a big reason why we're here as a country in this place, and so we can commit ourselves to making the smallest communities as we can around. Blue ourselves. Maga needs to dial it back um, and recognize that neighbor, maybe the party that they consider neighbor. to be infallible and and almost godlike, deity like, that has all the right answers, did not have all the right answers. You think you're cool with or whatever? It's time to get to know that person, and it's time to get to know the people that. Will the 20 million will votes be being gone, misinformation are real. Protect, Sorry, I just want to be educated. To yeah, it's not it's not real. Um, I mean, it is real in the sense that like it's 20 million less people voted to you. It's not. And creating but yeah, community voter turnout changes you, dramatically um, from election cycle to election cycle. One of the strongest, most powerful and also one of the most radical things you can do in an environment like this. So um For those who are some people are really blaming you for losing it's insane yeah uh, i don't know who's doing that but i want you to know that we're thinking of i you. think they're not of the and right mind we can start to generate some hassan derangement community. syndrome baby and sometimes Ver that's very even just real being in community with or small moments More, of humanity i know people say trump derangement syndrome like but with you are sometimes a very odd little things that can help them change their mind i think people just care at that I'm point people just care more about like work, but we have a long trying to fight um, their own personal battles us, and instead of like world changing events um, just want to say i love you all and this is going to be very hard and we're going to have to get through it together but we don't have a choice we don't have a choice we have no choice but to live and be in the times that we have been called to live in and to make it better one day at a time, one choice at a time. Never, ever, ever think that any choice or any act of yours is too small. It isn't. And regimes and autocracies are taken down by millions of drops of small actions that would otherwise be un invisible by masses of people. So I look forward to, to doing this work with you all. And this is, you know, this is the assignment that we have ahead of us. Um, we'll probably be doing a couple more of these ahead. Bye y'all. All right, that was AOC. There's a lot of words to say we messed up. Yeah, I mean, I get it. We did mess up, so it's true and by we i mean the democratic party messed up that would be the we for aoc surely neoliberalism dies one day uh yeah to thunderous applause <laughs> if she doesn't talk about changing the democratic party primary rules i'm sorry but she's duping the base yeah i agree with that i think that uh changes need to happen within the democratic party i just don't know like how to convince people put me in a room with all these corporate billionaires that are 
diehard Democratic Party loyalists, maybe not the ones that are pro-Israel, but like the rest of them. And I, I'll convince them. I'll convince them why they got to do a little bit of austerity for once, you know, in terms of their own profit margins for one goddamn day so that you can, uh, you know, so that we can combat fascism. Just go directly to the heart of the problem because I don't think there's anything ever shifting in the Democratic Party's priorities. So like half a dozen? Yeah. I blame the Didi Krats. <laughs> Me too. Why not argue with the pro-Israel ones? Because the pro-Israel, the, uh, the pro-Israel billionaires in the Democratic Party's base, uh, or not base, but can, in the Democratic Party's like corporate billionaire structure, they're not going to give a shit about what I have to say. I'm not going to be able to convince them. But for every Haim Saban, there's like 11 Miriam Adelsons on the Republican Party, so it doesn't even matter. And the Republican Party's base actively is like pushing for Israel to be more violent, more brutal. So that's the other side of the story, you know? This is a really straightforward... It was Joe. Oh yeah, we already watched this. Is it really straightforward but astute reading? Something I noticed with Democratic partisans and media was that they never ever talked about Biden's absolutely abysmal numbers. It's not even that they didn't reconcile it. They just closed their ears, eyes and plugged their ears. Estead is not like regular mainstream media reporters, I will say. And I'm not just saying that because he's been on the broadcast multiple times at this point and is a firm Hasanabi uh, friend of the show. You got a nice shout out here. I'm not of the Twitch generation. I probably watch 10 YouTube videos a year, but the only person I know on the left who's prepared to compete with this right wing dominance on these platforms is Hassan the Hun. Are there others? Taylor says there are others, but they only have tiny audiences, but they have zero funding. The entire right wing ecosystem is propped up by billionaire donors and right wing interest groups. There's zero equivalent on the left. I wrote about that here. This is true. That that is 100% true. 